via email a copy of our new church pictorial directory. Thank you to Ted. Um, and we have some of these printed up in hard copy. If you'd like one, see Becky Lester. Uh, we have uh, not a lot, but at least one for family, perhaps. And then I have more on my dining room table, and I'm still collating. So, uh, but uh, you may pick one of those up. And then also, Dennis had mentioned uh, this drilling rig, the truck there. Uh, was one that we lost. <laughs> it was one that our church helped purchase years ago, and uh, it was up north in Timbuktu when the uh, insurgents came in, and and Rich and Anna had to flee for their life, and the some of those terrorist organizations, I think there were like three of them up north that were fighting and took over, um, and, and that truck was dismantled, and the, the rig was taken off of it in different places, and and yet, by God's grace, over a few years after that, they were able to, we, we were praying and God answered, uh, they were able to locate the truck and the drill rig and, and get it all back together. Rich assembled it back together. So um, that's, a, that's a real answer to prayer in itself. And, and God has used uh, that as an evangelistic tool. Um, getting water isn't the most important thing. It's the water of life. But uh, being able to provide drill wells has given them an avenue to speak and preach about uh, Jesus Christ, the living water. So, which reminds me, another prayer request. You know who else just got one of those drilling rigs? Noah. <laughs> yep, that's what I thought. Okay, Noah. <laughs> so I sent him some uh, email things from Rich to Noah so that Noah maybe could get a little help and guidance on some of that. Uh, um, but obviously in, in, in uh, Ghana, there's some real need for wells to be drilled also. And we just pray that uh, it'll get shipped there and be able to be assembled and functioning uh, for the Lord. So uh, keep that in mind. We're studying the church. Um, it began in Acts chapter two, not the building, remember, the church is the people, the people of God. It's not a denomination, an association, or a name. It's the people of God. And it began here. Where's my little laser? Uh, on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came and birthed not just only the church, but he baptized, he identified Jews and Gentiles, placed them in one body, uh, the church. And this is the age of the church, and that's what we're studying. Um, the day of Pentecost. There's 37 million churches worldwide. Where'd they come from? How did that happen? Right here. Read your Bible. The Holy Spirit came down in a wonderful way on the day of Pentecost. And, and the church was born. And God saved people and added them to the church. And, and uh, His church now is composed of local churches. In fact, uh, like out of 110 out of 112 or 14 times it's used in the New Testament, the word church refers to a local assembly. And so churches like ours, like Grace Baptist Church, us together, the people of God meeting today, we are the church of God. And um, now not all 37 million of those churches worldwide are good, solid, founded churches. But uh, um, anyways, that's, that's where churches came from. And uh, read about it in our Bibles. That's what we're doing. So we, we want to understand what God wants of a church. What our church is supposed to be like. What we're supposed to be doing. How we're supposed to be behaving. And, and what our ministry ought to be. So uh, we, we looked at uh, the Apostles' Doctrine and how important that is a few weeks ago. Um, when we talk about the Apostles' Doctrine, we're not talking just about uh, New Testament Scripture, but obviously the whole Word of God. Uh, but the apostles can uh, finished writing the scriptures for us. So we have a completed revelation now. The apostles' doctrine obviously focuses more on the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, the death, burial, resurrection of Christ, his ascension, his uh, coronation, and uh, his coming again. And, and so the whole New Testament teaching of the church, apostolic doctrine. The word doctrine, again, just means teaching. The teaching, scriptural teaching, how important that is. That's... Uh, here in Acts chapter 2, it gives these four things. 
Sometimes when the Bible gives lists of things, sometimes they're in chronological order. Sometimes they're in order of importance. I don't know if that's the case here or not, but um, the importance of teaching and preaching truth is essential to the local church. It is the pillar and ground of the truth, 1 Timothy chapter 3. And so now we're working into uh, the second section, continuing steadfastly in fellowship, koinonia, communion. The word fellowship means to share together, to have in common, partner. It's a mutual partnership between Christians. That's what fellowship is. It's a, it's a what we share together, fellowship. A mutual bond that all true Christians have with Christ and that puts us in a deep eternal partnership with one another. In 1 John, John says that you may have fellowship with, with us and truly our fellowship is with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we have this fellowship with God and with each other. The sharing together. We have something in common. Not fingerprints. <laughs> not clothes. Not looks, not abilities, not an IQ. Everybody's different. But what we have in common is the Lord Jesus Christ. That He saved us. And He's caused us to be part of His family. He's birthed us together into His family. So in the studying of this fellowship, this is going to go on for a few weeks. It's actually going to be a focus of our church this year. Fellowship. Uh, God gave us some metaphors in the Bible uh, to describe the church. A metaphor is a figure of speech. Uh, it's a word picture. It's an illustration. Uh, it helps us understand better. It's a teaching method. And in Scripture, God gives us a number of these analogies or metaphors about the church, uh, the flock. The church is a flock. It's a body. It's a building. It's a marriage. It's a family. It's a brotherhood. There's a lot of them. And we're going to cover some of these in the next couple weeks. Last week we looked at the church as the family of God. And if you turn to Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to pick up here this week, Ephesians chapter 2. And notice at verse 19, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 19, it says, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. This picture of the church as the household of God, the family of God. We are family. This is such an important understanding here. He says this, Now therefore you are no longer strangers. Unknown. The word stranger is xenos. You're, you're unknown. You're foreigner. No, no, we're not foreigners anymore. Look around this church. Is anyone in here that you don't know? Are they a foreigner to you? They shouldn't be. They shouldn't be. Nor should they be, what's that next word there? Well, strangers is the word actually. I use foreigners, but foreigners there is a, is a word. Uh, Paraoikos means that you live right next door to them. Their house is right next door to yours. It was a word that was used of immigrants who've come from another country, but now they've moved in to your neighborhood and they live next door and they're your neighbors. But you know what? God says in the church they're not supposed to be that either. These aren't just people who've moved in and live next door. Look in the pew next to you. Do you know that person? Have they just moved in? Are they your neighbor? Do you kind of know them? Maybe they came from another church. Maybe from another state. But in the family of God, no, no. We don't want any of that. We don't want people that we don't know. Nor do we want people that are just our neighbors that live next door that are good friends. He says, no, you're, you're of the same kingdom. You're fellow citizens of the same kingdom. And, even greater than that, you're of the household of God. This is, a, this is amazing. When you come to church, you lose your last name, by the way. Just get rid of your last name. Quit sitting with each other. Sit together as the people of God. Because that's what you are here. You know, someone brought up that we shouldn't have the American flag up front. 
And there's a real truth to that. Now, if it reminds you to pray that this is our, our Jerusalem, our country is our primary mission field, that's good. But our family is Christ. <laughs> there's no nationalities in this church. There's no red, brown, yellow, black, or white people. We're family. We're one in Christ. And there should be no nationality. It's not like, oh, some people are African or French or German or anything else. No. And we're not promoting the United States over any other thing. We're here, assembled together as one family. And that ought to be reflected in everything we do. So I want to just take a minute. Be doers of the word, not hearers only, James says. I want you to get up and greet somebody. Maybe somebody, look around and find somebody you don't know as well as other people. And just spend about five minutes getting to know somebody, okay? Ask them where they came from, where they were born, where they live. Find out about them, okay? We're family. We don't want any strangers. We don't want any immigrants that have come in and we're just good friends. We're family. And so let's uh, get up in fellowship for a couple minutes and get to know them. That's what fellowship is all about in the family of God.
I hope I've whetted your appetite for a little further fellowship. This, this is what we want to be doing. Okay? So one of the most important things as a family is to destroy any anonymity and unknown people. We want to just uh, really get to know each other and uh, love on one another as the family of God ought to do. Alright, the church is also the body of Christ. And we already looked at that uh, last week or the week before. Uh, those are the three main passages in the New Testament which talk about the body. And again, the emphasis on the body is that there's many members, one body. And all the members are different, right? We have fingers and hands and ears and eyes and nose and toes and, and all the different organs. And, 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 and every one of us here, God, we're different, but yet God set each one in the body as it pleased Him. And we, like I said there in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you are the body of Christ. We're talking about the church at Corinth. Our church is the body of Christ. And, and so there's this, this sharing together in one body. And of course, Christ is the head, isn't he? Christ the head, we're the body. And uh, we, we are interconnected. That's the word koinonia, fellowship. It was this partnership, sharing together, interconnectedness in the body of Christ is so important. The church is also called the bride of Christ. Uh, we've been espoused to Christ as a pure virgin, Paul says. And uh, it's important for us to be holy. In fact, there's three main things uh, as the bride of Christ. One, we're to be enraptured with his love. I just awed at the love of God. That nothing's going to ever separate. He set his love upon us in eternity past. And that love will not change for eternity future. Can you believe that? His love for you does not change when you miss your devotions. That's right. You say, well, I feel a little guilty. Good. It doesn't change His love for you. He loved you in the past. Sent His Son to be your Savior. Sent His Spirit to draw you to Himself and save you. He's, his love is never, nothing's going to ever separate you from the love of God. That's an infinite, eternal love. <coughs> so we are to be enraptured with His love and... and as Paul said, that the love of Christ constrains me. Understanding how much He loves us moves us to love Him and serve Him. We love Him because He first loved us. And then we grow in our relationship. Father and mother, we put those aside. Or to cleave to our wife, right? Well, that's the relationship. Paul says, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. And that love of Christ for the church and the church's submission <coughs> to the head Christ, uh, that, uh, that's what we ought to be picturing. And then maintaining our purity, our holiness, as the uh, bride of Christ. We ought to be, we will someday be presented to Him a spotless, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Ephesians 5 says, but in the meanwhile, we ought to be growing in holiness and trying to to be the most pure, holy bride we can be for our Savior. And then the church is God's holy temple. And we're here in Ephesians chapter 2 still, uh, since we just looked at it earlier. And uh, he goes on. We, we looked at verse 19. And, and then he moves from, from the analogy or the metaphor of the church as a household, a family. And now he turns and in verse 20, he talks about this family as a temple, a building. He says in verse 20, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Uh, maybe he had in mind the uh, great temple in Jerusalem. Uh, maybe he had in mind other great Greek uh, Roman edifices. But, but the one thing in all of these was that there's a huge rock foundation that it's built upon. You know as well as I do that if you don't have a good foundation, the building will collapse. Uh, the building is not worth anything if you don't have a good foundation under it. And, and he says here that the, the foundation of the church, this household of God, the family of God, which we are, uh, we are built as a building, now like, this, like the temple here, out of these stones. And every stone was, was cut and chiseled and sanded and rubbed so it would fit perfectly into the next one. There's this interconnectedness. And he says you're, you're being fitted together. You're being built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. The foundation of the church. What it's built on? It's not philosophy. 
It's not the philosophies of man. It's not human traditions. Uh, people didn't just get together and come up and say, hey, let's, uh, let's uh, work on it. Maybe we can get a church. Let's do that. No. God did. God designed this. The church is established uh, not on human wisdom, not on Greek wisdom. Well, the Greeks were known for all their wisdom. Paul saying the church was not built on a uh, wisdom of man. It wasn't built on laws. The Romans were known for their law, the Roman law. It's not built on laws. The church of God is built on divine revelation. When he talks about the foundation of the apostles and prophets, he speaks to them as one. Not the apostles and the prophets, but the apostles and prophets, almost as they were one. They, and I don't even think he's distinguishing between Old Testament and New Testament. The Old Testament prophets and New Testament apostles. And he just, he's talking about the apostles and prophets as the spokes. The, the, the mouthpiece, the spokesperson of God who received the revelation from God and recorded it, it's what we have today in our Bibles. And, and, and Paul is saying that the church is built on a foundation of divine revelation. It comes from God. These 37 million churches, where did the world church come from? God established the church. God is the one who defined it and described it and established it and and this is His work. And so we're built upon, founded upon, the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And then it says, Jesus Christ Himself being the chief cornerstone. And by the way, what it, does, what it clearly does not say about the foundation there is, is Peter the Pope. Amen. <laughs> the foundation of the church is divine revelation. And the chief corner... You may even see that the word stone there is in italics. It's just the chief corner, the, the most important block in the whole building. In fact, they probably referred to the cornerstone, but it was that first block. That, and we talk about blocks, little 12 or 14, 16 inch blocks, 8 by 16. These temples that were built back then, um, I don't know if any of you have been to Israel and seen what remains of the, uh, the temple wall, but these blocks were were eight, ten feet long, three, four feet high. They weighed tons and tons, each block. They're massive. But they all set on the original first cornerstone, which was set, and that determined the, the level, the angle of every other stone. Everything derives its alignment from the cornerstone, that chief corner. And that's what Jesus Christ is. The church is nothing apart from Christ. There's nobody saved apart from Christ. He's the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Amen. Jesus Christ is. There is nothing apart from Him. His death, burial, and resurrection. You don't have forgiveness of sins. You don't have salvation. You don't have church. 37 million of them. There'd be no such thing if it weren't for Jesus Christ. Amen. He's, the, he's the keystone. Um, salvation is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's to be in Christ. It's to be a member of, his, of the body of Christ. It's all about Jesus Christ. He's the foundation of it. In verse 21 it says, In whom the whole building, that is the whole thing, every part of it, is being fitted together. God is putting us together and He's fitting us. That word is a, it's kind of a unique word. It's a, a double compound word. It's about this long. And uh, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a Pauline word. He made it up. Okay, and Paul does this quite often. I've been guilty of that myself a few times. But this is a word that Paul made up. It's not found anywhere else in classical Greek or anything else. This is a word Paul made up. It's only used two times in the whole Bible. Um, but it means uh, to be conjoined together uh, tightly. And again, it really talks about the fellowship of the church, doesn't it? <laughs> that God has set us together in one family. So it's not only used uh, here about the church, but you notice over in chapter 4 and verse 16, the only other time that this word is used, chapter 4 of Ephesians, verse 16, He's talking about the body 
from whom the whole body joined. The word joined there. It's the same word as he used to fit it together. It means being joined <coughs> together. And then he adds uh, also the next word, and knit together. Joined and knit. So they're, they're being fitted together. They're being put together. Um, and that's in a reference to the body. The other analogy of the church. And so back in chapter 2, it's the temple that God has in mind here that he is chiseling and building and putting together these stones that compose the temple. And so in, the, in whom the whole, back in 221, in whom the whole building is being fitted together. And by the way, that's in the, in, in a, the present tense. It means that it's, it's an ongoing process. God is still at work. And so when you uh, see, when you look at my life, I got this little invisible sign over my head, under construction. God's not finished with me yet. Okay? So be patient. Uh, when you come into our church and the, we assemble on a Sunday, you know what? We're not perfect. The church of God. God is still not finished assembling it or chiseling the parts. And sometimes... You know, when, when the builders would bring a stone in and they'd set it up there and, and it would wobble and then they'd have to take it back down and chisel a little bit more and sand a little bit more and then they'd set it back up there. And sometimes that's what we are. We, we're not quite fitting together. God's not finished with the church yet. It's being fitted together and it's growing into a, what's this, a holy temple. Wow! A temple! This isn't just a building. God says what I'm building is the temple. The temple where the, where the presence of holy God resides. This is where God tabernacles. This is where God, His presence is manifest. Is, is in the assembly of His people in the church of God. Which is being constructed as a temple. A holy temple. Sacred. Set apart. You know today when we've come together... We aren't meeting like a PTA meeting here or Elks Club or Lions Club. This isn't a club or an association of people. This is the assembly of the people of God, the family of God, the body of Christ, the temple of God. God's presence is here in a unique way that is not manifest any other place other than other true churches of God around. But the church, when the assembly of God's people, God's presence, it's a holy temple. Just like in the Old Testament, you know where God's presence was by the pillar of fire by day and the pillar of cloud, at, or the, uh, <coughs> cloud in the day and fire at night, the tabernacle, and then, and then when the temple was built, the cloud ascended down on it. The presence of God there in the temple. Well, today, the people of God, it's not a building, it's the people of God that duplicate that, that we are the residence, the, the, the place where God dwells in this world today. You think it's important that the people of God assemble? And when you do, that you come with a mindset knowing that we're going to meet with God. God's presence is going to be there today. Very special. He says in verse 22, in whom you also are being built together. You, the Ephesian church, the local church there at Ephesus, just like you, Grace Baptist Church here, you are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. The dwelling place of God. His Spirit has come to reside here. Well, what are some of the implications? We, the people of God, the family of God, are placed in community with each other, fitted together, joined together, to be a holy dwelling place. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it talks about what? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? He's talking about individual Christians. You go from here and that you yourself, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who resides within you. You are a sacred being. You're not your own. You've been bought with a price. 
Therefore, you have a, a responsibility to glorify God in your body and your spirit. That's individual, but here he's talking about the church collectively is the dwelling place of the Spirit of God. God is present in our world through us. Think about that. God is manifested. God presents himself to this world through you and I, his people, the family of God. How do you represent God in the world? How do people see you? Tomorrow you go to work, stop at the store, get together with some friends after work, go out to eat with unsaved people. Do they see the presence of God in you? How do you manifest God? We are the temple of God. Holiness and interdependence is essential, isn't it? being fitted together to be a holy temple. We're still under construction. Let's go over to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Verse 5. He uses this analogy again. He says, you also as living stones. You're living stones. That's right. We're not dead, inanimate stones, chiseled. No, we're the living stones. We've been born again. We're alive. We're people. Living stones are being built up a spiritual house. A holy priesthood. Offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. He uses different analogies here, doesn't he? He starts off with the living stones being built up as a house, a home for God. And then he switches to, we're also a priesthood. What does the priesthood do? We mediate for God. As the people of God, we mediate. We, we speak for God to the people. and We represent people to God. And we offer up spiritual sacrifices of praise and worship. Service. We're living stones. We're built on a living foundation, by the way. Notice back in verse 4, Jesus Christ coming to Him as to a living stone. Rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. <laughs> He's Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone. He's a living stone, living foundation, living cornerstone upon which us living stones are built in the house of God. So we're alive in Christ. We're being built up again. It's, it's always in progress. A spiritual house, not physical buildings, is it? Sometimes people keep thinking the church is this building. No, this is where the church meets. This is just a building. Okay? This building isn't holy. It's not the church. We are. This big room here isn't the sanctuary. Nothing sanctified about this room. It's an auditorium. We're sitting in chairs, pews. Okay? They don't mean anything. You can kids can run up and down in here. Okay? They gotta be careful not to knock over some of the adults, but. This isn't a sanctuary. When the people of God go out of here, this is an empty room. It's the people of God that are the church, the residence, the household, the dwelling place of God. And we are a holy priesthood serving and mediating for God, offering spiritual sacrifices. I was conflicted this morning when I put those references up for you to bookmark during the tithes and offering time because I didn't want that to interfere with what you should be doing when the tithes and offerings are being taken up. And maybe we forget about that. That's part of our worship, isn't it? And we should be consciously thinking, I'm giving whatever I'm giving to the Lord here. I'm giving this to express my worth, my worship to the Lord. What he, what's He worth to me? Well, we can't put that much in because we don't have that much. He's worth everything. We're the whole realm of nature mine. I'd be a present far too small. But we give as an expression. Lord, this is a token of my love for you. 
part of our worship. We offer spiritual sacrifices to the people of God. All right, let's turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He says, uh, again, and let's, well, we're in chapter 3, but if you go back to chapter 1, and verse 2, I just want you to be reminded who he wrote this book to. Paul wrote, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2, to the church of God, which is at Corinth. Okay? That is to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called saints. So he's writing to the, to the church, and, and now we go to chapter 3, and this is what he says in verse 16 and 17. He says, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? We are a special, a special group of people assembled here today. We're the saints, the holy ones, people have been, that God has called out from among the whole world, made His people, birthed into His family, built up into His temple. And that's us. Just look at this. He says, and, uh, if anyone defiles the temple of God, verse 17, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which you are. Do you, do you get a sense of the, um, the... You want to use the word awesome? Here it is, people. How awesome that is. Supernatural. Divine. You are a special, unique, peculiar people that God has saved. Determined to save in an eternity past and has brought to fruition now. And in this local area, and He's assembled us as His people. And we meet together and we are the temple of God. Well, let me just tell you something else about the church here. First of all, there shouldn't be any personality cults. And that was a problem earlier in the chapter. Remember, uh, they said, I'm of Paul or I'm of Paulus. Oh, no, we don't want any of that. Paul says, no, no, one, one, one plants and one waters. It's God who gives the increase. God is the one who builds his family. God is the one who's fitting together his church. It's God's work. No person, no man, no pastor, no deacon, no... Trust me, no Sunday school teacher. Nobody is building this church. It's God. God is the builder. And we start idolizing or worshiping a person. It's idolatry. He says in verse 12 and 13, better be careful on how you build. If anyone builds, verse 12, on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it's been revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved yet as through fire. We need to give, as it says there, be careful. You gotta know how to, how to build. And in our own lives, and as we build each other up, and as we work as co-laborers of God, building the church collectively, God works through us. We need to give careful thought on how we build, how, we, how we're working uh, with each other to build the church of God. Verse 17, I think, is important. He says, if anyone defiles the temple of God. Wow. Wow. Don't mess with God's church. This is the dwelling place of God. These are special people of God. It's the family of God. We're set apart. We're holy. Don't, don't destroy this. Don't, don't, don't mess with it. Now earlier in the chapter, there had been some false prophets, false teachers who are trying to undermine and destroy the church. Sometimes there are people within the church, wolves from within the church, who seek to undermine and destroy God's flock, God's family. Don't mess with God's church. 
Some people say, well, I've never taken an active role in trying to destroy God's church. But can we destroy the work of God? Can we destroy God's church, God's family by maybe we just don't support it, we don't help it, we don't attend, we don't participate? There's a lot we can do that is negative. God, <laughs> this is God's church. And by the way, it says in Ephesians chapter 5 that he loved the church and gave himself. In, in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, he tells the pastors there to shepherd the flock of God, which he purchased with his own blood. He loves the church. Don't mess with it. Don't undermine it. Don't destroy it. Proverbs chapter 6, you perhaps remember that passage where it says, These six, six things the Lord hates, yea, seven are an abomination. And one of those is, he who sows discord among the brethren. Why is that so bad? Well, because you're messing with the, with the church of God. The holy temple that God's trying to fit together. You don't want to be trying to rip it apart. The family of God that God is bringing together. You don't want to be pulling it apart. The body of Christ, which God is setting the members in the body as it pleased Him, and He's trying to get them to function together. You're trying to pull them apart. No. Don't mess with God's family. Again, he says here, do you not know that you are the temple? Verse 16, you are the temple of God. It's not the building, it's the people. We've run out of time. I originally thought that I had like five of these uh, metaphors I was going to go through all in one message. But all these metaphors are so important. God, obviously God gives them for a reason when he, when he inspired uh, the writing of these scriptures. And he, he puts these in here so we get a better understanding what the church is like. And what we've seen so far is, is how important oops, uh, all these analogies show the interconnectedness, don't they? The people of God. What is that? That's why in Acts chapter 2, they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine in truth and what? And in fellowship. Sharing together. We're going to see uh, next week how that... Well, maybe not next week. <laughs> in a couple of weeks, we're going to see how that worked out practically in Acts chapter 2. Heavenly Father, we, just, we thank you for your love for us. Uh, for your love for the church. That you laid down your life for us. You purchased us with your own blood. And we are a special, special people above all those in the world. And we assemble here locally as your people, your family, your bride. The one you set your love upon. The one you're here dwelling amongst and working, assembling. We just pray, Lord, that we would love your church too. And that would be manifest in our care for each other throughout the week. That our communication would go beyond a Sunday visit. But that we would be loving and praying for and encouraging and helping one another in our lives daily. As it says in the book of Hebrews, exhort one another daily. Well, it is today. So, Father, we just pray that you'd move our church away from a Sunday-only idea and help us to understand that your church is a living, functioning entity, a family that functions throughout the week together. And we'll be careful to praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, let's take our hymn books and sing uh, Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us. Mm -hmm.